Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, Phase 2, Old Testament History, Chapter 1, Session 6, Genesis, the precedent for the Word. So far in this class, we have been seeing God's greatness for sure. In my studies, prayers, and meditations on His Word over the years, I have accumulated many insights on various subjects, some of which were not related to what I was concentrating upon at the time. So I tucked them away in various notes or tried to remember them when I was not able to write them down. Because sometimes I realize stuff while I'm driving my car or sometimes even in the shower. So what do you want me to do, Lord? Help me remember what you told me. I must confess that there have been some things over the past 45 years of research that I can't remember. So please pray that they come back to mind when I need them. As we know, for the past three and a half years, I've been concentrating on the seven ones of original Christianity. But I still was occasionally realizing some stuff from other subjects, like the Old Testament and the Gospel. So now in these sessions, I get to pull those things back out and present them. Therefore, I'm still anticipating and we're going to have lots of fun here in chapter one of Old Testament history. In this session, I want to take my study of repetitions further by expanding upon that section in I, where I analyzed Genesis 1 and realized that it set the literary precedence for the rest of the word. We've heard a bit about the grandeur of our Creator and the One God of Original Christianity class and understood more of Him from the Hello Elohim session of this class. The cosmic microwave background radiation from the Big Bang from creation has proven to us that something from outside of the universe shook all of it simultaneously. (laughs) <laughs> wow. Something from a super dimension outside of space-time, and therefore not subject to its bounds, is out there. All-powerful. Proven by the bigness of the bang. <laughs> and spaceless. That is, it's everywhere present. And timeless. That is, it's eternal. And because it has been everywhere throughout time, simultaneously, it's been there and done that. So, it is all-knowing. Hello, Elohim. (laughs) That is in your face proof. And the knowledge of CMB, Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, has been around for decades. But had you heard anything like that? No, because scientists don't want to talk about what they don't or won't understand. But that's the logical conclusion to the fact. So Romans says, they are without excuse. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest among them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. You see, you know, if you you got yourself a brand new watch, took it out of the box and put it on your wrist, wound it up, and all of a sudden it went doing and fell apart. You, you'd say the guy that made this watch didn't know what he was doing. But on the other hand, if you take that watch out and put it on and It just tells time faithfully and works and works and doesn't fail. You can tell that whoever made that 
knows what he was doing. Well, that's what we see with the things of God. And his fingerprints are all over us. And that imprint is reciprocal because we hunger for him. Look at Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 22, Paul was there in Athens, the intellectual capital of the world at that time. And there he was at the center of it all on Mars Hill. And he said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. For as I passed by, Paul said, and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And that was fortuitous, because the Athenians had been so tired of everybody coming to them and telling them about some new God. They said, the next guy that comes in here and tells us about a new God, we're going to kill him. Well, ha <laughs> ha. Paul knew about that, and so he declared unto them the unknown God that they had an altar to already. <laughs> God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, and neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. <laughs> it's like a big cosmic game of pin the tail on the donkey. For in him we live and move and, and have our being. As certain also your poets, he told them, have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. See? So if we truly are God's offspring, we truly have some of him in us. Look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Original man in the garden reflected God's traits. Now, I gotta go where angels fear to tread here. Into the midst of controversy, again, because of the theological arguments that have raged for centuries over the meaning of those two terms in Hebrew and Greek, image and likeness. Image is tselem in Hebrew, Icon in Greek. Likeness is demuth in Hebrew and homoiosis in Greek. But let's put on our thinking caps because what is an image? Is an image the thing itself? No, it's definitely not the thing itself. It's a representation of the surface of an object, that which can be comprehended. I don't care how much one wants their theology to match. It's absolutely not the item itself. It's a replica of it in recognizable physical form. 
Now, I say recognizable because it does not need to match exactly, does it? Of course not, because there's pictures, sculptures, bass reliefs, coins, and even caricatures that bear resemblances, right? How much or what kind of resemblance depends on the artist and their competence and their intent. Remember, Jesus asked the Pharisees for a coin and asked whose image was on it. Was that coin Caesar? No, that coin was not Caesar himself. It was a representation of him. It bore his recognizable form, his resemblance. But we have a problem with the occurrence in Genesis. Because throughout the rest of the Bible, this word is used to describe idols which are fashioned to look like the thing they represent. Look at Numbers 33, verse 52. Take a look. Numbers 33, 52. It says, Then shall ye drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images, that's the word, sell them, and quite pluck down all their high places. Ezekiel 16 has another occurrence of it. Ezekiel 16, verse 17. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images, there's the word, of men, and didst commit whoredom with them. But they worshiped him. So, but no man has seen God, right? So how do we know what he looks like? And further, God is spirit. Consequently, who would in their right mind expect God to look like Michelangelo's representation of him on the ceiling of a Sistine Chapel in Italy? <laughs> I, I recently saw a Photoshop version of that in which it was an orange cat <laughs> reaching out to touch Adam. <laughs> well, does God have hands? Does, does he have feet? Does he have a human shape? Who knows? So if God is unseen, what can his image be? Well, let's hold that question for a moment, because this word does not stand alone. It is coupled there in Genesis with likeness. Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, what is a likeness? In Hebrew, it just means a similarity in general. Greek, being more detailed, has three words that cover the same range in meaning as one word in Hebrew. Homoousios, exactly like having the same substance. Homoousios with the iota diminutive in the middle. Almost like or of like nature. And homoiosis is likeness. That's further off. Uh, and then homoios is generally like. So the first two are, are guess what? not found in the Greek Bible. <laughs> the only the last one, which is the kingdom of heaven is like, it happens a lot of, it occurs a lot of places. Or when we see him, we shall be like him, homoios. And also homeosis is in the Septuagint a couple times, including in Greek here in Genesis 126, likeness. So what we have here is interesting because image and likeness are two synonyms juxtaposed. Except the first one, image, usually is a representation of a physical thing. But God is not physical. He's spiritual. Therefore, the image of God cannot be physical. It must be a representation spiritually. And that's exactly what it is. God made man in his image spiritually. He gave man spirit. And that spirit is to God what an icon 
would be to what it emulates physically. An artistic resemblance and to what degree depends on the competence and intent of the artist. Oh, God's the artist. Wow. And that's exactly what the image of God is throughout the rest of the Bible. The image of God is the Holy Spirit in man in its various administrational and or covenanted forms throughout time. For more information on that, I recommend my One Spirit of Original Christianity class. Man needed that spirit to exercise dominion over the earth. That was the job that God gave Adam to do. But there's even more here to be understood. And we can do so because of the scope of the word that we have gained from the 7 1 series. This is because we have approached the subject of the identity of God from the standpoint of who he is and not who he is not. Rene Fretz, my co-teacher, and I found about 45 traits of God. Then, following Rene's lead in his original study on the subject, I showed that God gave his son, Jesus Christ, as many of those traits as he could in the Pleroma. Some could not be given such as infinitude, or omnipotence, or omnipresence, or eternalness. Because those are absolute. Either you is or you ain't. And there can only be one that is. So there's no room for any other. Like with infinitude. (laughs) There only can be one that's infinite. I recommend the one God of original Christianity for more on that, but Then God shared as much as he could with his son. Because that's what fathers do, isn't it? And so God put all things that he could under his son's feet, delegated as much as he could, as we saw in the one Lord of original Christianity class, and also in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 27 and 28. But we're not done yet. Because in Renee's original study on the subject, He showed, further, how many of those same divine traits filtered down all the way to man through Christ. That's what we presented in the one faith of original Christianity class. So with that scope, we know exactly what in our image and after our likeness means. Because just like with the second Adam, Christ was delegated powers and traits. The first Adam likewise received an allotment commensurate with his position and duty. But there's even more here in Genesis 126 and 28. And it is expressed in the literary features in Genesis deftly by means of of repetitions but not only that even in a more sagacious display of magnificence it's repetitions upon repetitions sevenfold in genesis 126 through 28 and for even more flair subtle variations added for increased spice so how could those with a false agenda who only read verse 26 to try to prove their theology totally miss the scintillating elegance and profound beauty that's here. We now enter the arena of figures of speech. (laughs) The artistry of words, the paint of ideas, the colors of thought. Many grammarians and rhetoricians relegate the use of figures to being mere ornaments which render a discourse more pleasing to the ear. But as we have seen, they are far more than that. A figure of speech is a verbal ornament, a rhetorical device, which achieves special effects by using words in unusual ways. Any device or pattern of language in which meaning is enhanced or 
changed. That's quoted from Richard Lanham, a hand list of rhetorical terms. E.W. Bollinger, in his exhaustive presentation on the subject, says, quote, all language is governed by law, but in order to increase the power of a word or the force of an expression, these laws are designedly departed from, and words and sentences are thrown into and used in new forms or figures. These are not used haphazardly. A figure of speech is not a category into which we may assign things at a whim when it suits our theology. They must fit patterns of the other occurrences of that same figure. Bullinger again asserts, quote, Whenever and wherever it is possible, the words of Scripture are to be understood literally. But when a statement appears to be contrary to our experience or to known fact or revealed truth or seems to be at variance with the general teaching of the Scriptures, then we may reasonably expect that some figure is employed, unquote. E.W. Bollinger in his book, Figures of Speech in the Bible, on page 169, opens the second section of his book on the various forms of repetitions. There is a whole section of figures of speech on repetitions. And he says, all these various forms of repetition and addition are used for the purpose of attracting our attention and of emphasizing what is said, which might otherwise be passed by unnoticed. When we reflect that no error in composition is more readily made than the undue repetition of words, which is called tautology, it's remarkable that there are more than 40 different ways of repeating words used by the Holy Spirit. Over 40 legitimate modes of breaking the law which governs the use of language, of repeating words in such a way that not only is there no tautology, but beauty is added to the composition and emphasis given to the sense. Unquote. There is no section of the Bible more ornate with the various forms of repetitions than the beginning here in Genesis. But before I finish with the Genesis of man, Genesis 126 through 128, we need to get a running start. So we're going to start from verse 3. In my white paper on repetitions in the Bible, when I introduced Genesis 1, I said, now I'm going to prove to you how important repetitions are to the study of the Bible and to unlocking the heart of Scripture because they are obviously present in the precedent-setting passage of the Bible that began everything. Genesis 1. So, let's get started. The whole chapter is so full of figures of speech, we won't have time to cover them all. It is, first of all, a huge polysyndeton. That's the one with many ands and, 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 that polysyndeton goes all the way through the entire chapter. The way you work a polysyndeton is one must stop and consider each phrase and not run through the list. That conveys the gravity of this chapter. Other figures that we won't have time really to cover, just going to mention them, are in verses 1 and 2. It goes, and the earth and the earth. That's epanadiplosis. Verse 2, without form and void in Hebrew, is thahu, bahu. That sing-songy nature, same-soundingness, is a figure called paranomasia. Uh, the faces of the deep is a pleonasm. Also in verse 2, the word moved in Hebrew is brooded, like a hen would brood. So that is anthropopathia. 
Then the evening and the morning that happens throughout there in the days that are expressed is a synecdoche. Herb yielding seed is literally seeding seed, which is a polyptoton, and the list goes on. But tonight I want to feature the repetitions. So the first type of repetition I want to highlight in Genesis 1 is the one that's used to separate the days. And it reads, and the evening and the morning was the first day, and the evening and the morning was the second day, the evening and the morning was the third day, etc. This repetition functions as a divider to set off units. In this case, the units were periods of time. Later on in the Bible, when this is used, the, the kind of units will vary, but the principle is the same. It functions like a paragraph marking. This figure of repetition is called Ame Bayon. A-M-O-E-B-A-E-O-N. Or refrain. The repetition of the same phrase at the end of successive sentences. This figure, Amebayon, is when there are a bunch of them. But when there are only two, I think that's a separate figure, which I call Sumpexis, S-U-M-P-E-X-I-S, which is framing. Another name for it would be bookending. That's when the first phrase, repetition, introduces, and the second phrase, repetition, concludes. There's only two of them. A may buy on is when there's more than two. And the opening and cl- concluding repetition reflect what is covered in between. That's what makes it a sympaxis. This kind of phrase, repetition, a may buy on, serves to separate passages of units of thought into paragraphs. Each day is a unit unto itself brimming with significance (laughs) as Melvin Elliott told us in the last session and Diane Martinez will show us in the next I'm just showing you the literary patterns tonight the outlines of the picture Mel and Diane and others are going to be coloring them in but my main point tonight is to show you the power that repetitions hold over this passage It's very full of them. It's pregnant with them. And since this passage sets the foundation for the whole Bible and for all the earth and us as well, it demonstrates how these rhythms set up here will affect the word elsewhere. It is the precedent for prophetic content. Look for repetitions. They rule here as they rule everywhere else. That's why I've concluded that repetitions are the strongest category of figures of speech. We learned the figures of speech were for emphasis. So when I learned that, I wondered, well, what does one do if there are more than one figure of speech present? You know, I've been in teachings where Several figures have been pointed out occurring in the same verse. And I was out there in the crowd wondering, well then, am I supposed to yell that verse? That's what I was thinking. If figures are for emphasis and several have clustered together, should we yell the verse when we read it? I know that sounds funny, but that's what I was wondering. And also that's how I frame my questions to God. Because I'm I'm continually aware that he's watching. I know that he knows what I'm thinking. And so I address him in my thoughts often. And I ask him lots of questions. And there are times then I receive answers. Sometimes like in the mornings, in the twilight sleep, somewhere between being asleep and awake. Or when I'm quiet of heart, in between busy things. Or at moments of worship. Or sometimes when I see something fit in the Word and I'm rejoicing. Or sometimes just out of the blue. And it was one of those times I realized that if figures are for emphasis 
and there are so many kinds of figures, some have got to be more emphatic than others. There's got to be primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of emphasis. And that is how I came to understand that repetitions are the most emphatic figures because they control whole contexts and sometimes even structure entire books of the Bible. So, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I will be able to label some of these word patterns specifically, but others more in general because they're so intricate. What we have here in Genesis 1 is the greatest of all orally transmitted passages. There is a sharp contrast in style from Genesis 2 and beyond. I think we can safely say then that Genesis 1 is a pre-existing work to Moses. It still was by revelation, no doubt, as this was given to the prophets long before Moses and long before alphabetic writing was invented, passed down generation to generation. But Moses was the first one to write it down. So this is the first word indeed, but also the last word in prophetic speech. It is so deep that is it's difficult to categorize all the patterns herein. In lieu of naming the patterns, I may have to just tally their effects. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. This is a literary masterpiece which will affect a language, a culture, and a world. It is set forth in simple, non-technical language when the subject matter could have been very technical. Then there are other repetitions in the content for each day that set up rhythms. It's like poetry, like music. It's beautiful. And God said, and God said, and God said. On each day, God said something. And it came to pass. This repetition demonstrates the power of God's rhema, words, his individual spoken words. By scope, we know that each administration begins with God's rhema, spoken out of thin air, in concretion, rumbling over the earth like thunder, which anyone could hear. That's spoken of in Hebrews 11, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the ages were repaired by the rhema of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That is what we are seeing here in Genesis. And God said, and God said, and God said. Next repetition is, and God called, and God called, and God called. God was the one who defined concretion out of chaos. He defined things. He gave them names. Well, he's the owner of everything, <laughs> so he has the right to name it whatever he wants. And then the next repetition, and it was so, and it was so, and it was so. Things happened when God spoke. There were results, because God is all-powerful. His words shake the universe. 
And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. All these are so simply put, but so profound. The works of God produce good, order, perfection, day after day. We see this in the first words of the Bible, and we see it in the last words in the Bible. Remember how the word voice is repeated so many times in the book of Revelation? Heaven, and hence also earth, is managed by words, by heavenly commands. So, what are these figures? Well, if the repetition were an irregular pattern with the word, it would be repetitio. If it were an irregular pattern with a phrase, epibol. But there is a pattern. If at the beginning of successive sentences, it would be anaphora. If at the end of successive sentences, epiphosa. But these sentences are not successive. The pattern repeats on a paragraph basis. So it is closer to a koinotes, C-O-E-N-O-T-E-S, koinotes, repetition, which is of two phrases, one at the beginning and one at the end of successive paragraphs. But it's more than two phrases. I showed you four phrases in there. Well, this is as close as I can get, but the effect of all the types of repetition is to convey the implication of the passage. It took much thought and intent to craft such a beautiful thing. So it must be important. It is genius, artistry, beauty, and intricacy all bound together to convey the same of the maker of the world created and formed by our author, Elohim. God said and God called. This emphasizes the power of God's words, for the results were, and it was so. And God saw that it was good. This sets the precedent for all of God's actions. They are initiated by his word. The results happen, and they're good. God is all good. Verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. On the second and third days, another kind of of repetition is introduced. On the first day, God had divided the light from darkness. And then in verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw it was good. Well, dividing and gathering are opposites, right? By these, God set up rules for existence. Those rules are called the foundations of the world. This kind of repetition is a synonomia which is the repetition of synonyms or antonyms. I looked, they don't have a figure of speech antinomia, okay? I'm not telephibio, okay? It bears the same powers as a regular repetition to communicate gravity and importance, but the subtle or the opposing meanings, those changes invite an extra layer of thought, it is a clue 
to indicate there's further significance to ponder when you see a synonymia. Now here, when one divides, one sets the criteria by which one thing is divided from another. Well, that involves rule making. Well, who makes the rules around here in this world? God does. Later, man got into trouble with the light and the dark, good and evil, dividing it. And he was tempted by the possibility of making his own rules between the two. Then he got in trouble. Verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass the herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day every day increases with complexity and the patterns of repetition grow as well. So now are introduced more repetitions like the phrase after his kind and the phrase whose seed is in itself. All life propagates via genus, kind, and species, never greater. On the taxonomy scale, only genus and species can procreate. That taxonomy scale, that's a catalog of life, right? There's species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, and domain. To which I must add one more category, dimension. Physical life that's in space-time or spiritual life that's not. All physical life is after its kind and whose seed is in itself. That is, all life can propagate itself because its seed is in itself. It makes its own seed. But spiritual life does not have its seed in itself. In itself. In other words, the capacity to produce seed is not within itself in spirit. Spirits cannot propagate. There's different kinds of spirits, cherubim, seraphim, etc., including the different kinds of spirit upon man throughout the administrations. But it is brought into being from something outside itself. Its seed is not in itself. That is, God creates spirit. That's the only way. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. See? You see the relationship between ruling and dividing in verse 18. Isn't that interesting? Another, they make the rules. See? Another grouping of synonyms is God made and God created. To create is to make something from nothing. To make is to take already existing substance and make it into something else. The three things that God created are, number one, all the matter and energy in the heavens and the earth and the universe. Number two, living soul in all animals. And number three, his spirit in man and the other spirits. After 
number one was created god later remade it into the firmament and the sun and the moon then the earth verse 20 and god said let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that had life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven and God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every wing and follow after his kind. And God saw it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So now it's expanded. God said, God said, God said, God called, God called, God called, and now God blessed. Isn't that beautiful? Another set of repetitions is this tenfold repetition of after its kind. Wow, that is really emphatic because it is the fundamental law of all life. Everything must be after its kind. But then when we get to God's creating his image in man, it changes to after his likeness. So there are important implications to this. Because we saw physical life has seed in itself. It reproduces. Spiritual life does not reproduce. Wow. <laughs> so, verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing. And beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. And cattle after their kind. And everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now we get to verse 26. Now we're ready. From verse 3 on to verse 25 is the build-up to verse 26 through 28, where God makes man. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So now, we can really appreciate the pinnacle of God's handiwork. And herein is a seven-fold repetition in verse 26 through 28. The first form of that repetition is a handiades, which is in our image after our likeness. A hendiades, H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S, is a figure in which two things are expressed, but they're supposed to be combined into one. So literally, it would be, let us make man in the likeness of our image. Now, it's kind of funny to read the efforts of the commentators as they try to shoehorn in their agendas to this passage. But the scope that we understand, actually, is the ultimate axe to grind here. Like father, like son, like brothers. <laughs> now, one guy said there, there's no real difference between image and likeness. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. Then there are those who harp on the let us and the our. But they never seem to read the rest, which puts the same thing in the singular. Well, that makes it obvious that one is figurative and the other is literal. Okay. <laughs> ba <-bum -bum. laughs> I, <laughs> I need to turn off my phone. 
Oh, that was funny. But anyway. <laughs> so there are some who harp on the let us and the our, but they never seem to read the rest of the passage because it puts the same thing in the singular. And that makes it obvious that one's figurative and one's literal. Then there's the Arian argument between same substance or similarity that's found in that loaded translation in Hebrews 1.3. But those words, same substance and similarity that they use, are not even in the Bible. So what does that tell you? They're, they're arguing about vapor. There's lots of agendas spawned here. But what it's really saying is that there were spiritual attributes and moral qualities given to Adam that were divine in nature with which he exercised dominion, rulership over the world and the things in the world. So let's read the whole thing. This is a divine decree with all the trappings, including the bells and whistles. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, created he him male and female created he them and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth you get the the gist of some of those repetitions there Repetition number one, the handy it is, converted into the literal, is in the likeness of an image. Okay? There's an additional layer there with the plural I'll get to in a moment. Repetition number two is the dec decree itself, in which the word dominion occurs in the first decree, and then again, when it is repeated in the second part, but in the second part, it's further expressed and fully parsed as be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So there's a polysyndeton there to emphasize each facet in particular. All right. Then repetition number three is to the full degree over, over, over. And that's five times. It's absolutely over. But by grace, number five. Repetition number four. The royal magnitude. Let us make man in our image versus God created man in his image. That is a royal heterosis expressing the magnitude of the speaker, then explained in the second statement in the singular. Repetition number five is the true maker, created, 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 three times. God is the perfect prime mover. Repetition number six has a subtle change. It is image and likeness followed by image and and image. Ooh. And finally, repetition number seven. The perfection of finality over, 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 three times. Wow. How delicious. This is the royalist of all ro royal decrees given in the richest, most profound way. Now, I covered the Handiades, but there is more to it. What does it mean in an image after a likeness, or literally, in the likeness of an image. What does that mean? Now, here is where I depart from some students of the Bible. Some folks will ponder on this 
and they will think that whatever strikes their minds is from the Holy Spirit. I don't do that because what comes to mind could be from last night's pizza. <laughs> I don't want to come up with an idea that's based upon my modern impression of a 3,500-year-old document translated from a language and from a different linguistic family and from an altogether different culture. Uh, that would be folly. So, instead, I get out my concordance and figures of speech book. And I look for other occurrences of figures, words, and phrases. And lo and behold, I didn't have to look very far. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. There it is and called his name Seth. Seth means sprout. <laughs> Whoa, Nelly. what about the rest of his sons? The next verse said he had more. Well, uh, what about Cain and Abel that were before Seth? Why does it say that Seth was in his own likeness after his image? But about Seth, but not about the others. And, and why is it in the opposite order to Genesis 1.26? Ooh. Likeness first, image second. This bears further analysis. So, now we go to Bollinger, page 657 and 658, regarding the figure of speech, Hendiades. See, I, I don't say to myself, oh, I know all about Hendiades. I make myself turn there and read it each time to make sure I understand it. Hendiades, Bullinger says, on page 657, is from Hen, one, dia, by, and dis, two. Literally, one by means of two. In other words, two words are employed, but only one thing or idea is intended. One of the two words expresses the thing, and the other of synonymous or even different signification, not a second thing or idea, intensifies it by being changed, if it's a noun, into an adjective of a superlative degree, which is by this means made specially emphatic. Now, hendiades also can be verbs, so if it's a verb, then the second one is made into an adverb. Bullinger goes on to say this figure is truly oriental and it's exceedingly picturesque. It is found in Latin as well as in Hebrew and Greek and is very frequently used in both the Old and New Testaments. The two words are of the same parts of speech, i.e. two nouns or two verbs always joined together by a conjunction and the two nouns are always in the same case. Now, it's curious. Bullinger states that, quote, they are always joined by an end. <laughs> but then he cites as his first example in the figures of speech book, Genesis 126. <laughs> that doesn't have an end. See? Ooh. Furthermore, in Genesis 126, they are two successive phrases. The first with the Hebrew baith prefix, a B prefix, which means in. And the second with a kaf prefix, a K, which means like. In So it's in the image, like the likeness, literally. But in Genesis 5.3, the baith and the kaf are reversed in the likeness like the image. <laughs> wow. So there is a good example of the difference between Hebrew and Greek. Both can be used to communicate subtle things. Hebrew uses every trick in the linguistic book. Changing the order, changing the bath and the kaf. All right. 
and different figures of speech and it does so with a limited vocabulary. Greek does the same thing with a more detailed galaxy of grammar and vocabulary. In both cases, one must pay attention and see what is going on and then think, think, think. After that, when we see it in its own ancient light, maybe we'll get some spiritual information then that helps us understand it further. But one has to work first. Because the spiritual riches are not doled out to the lazy or the entitled. They go to the industrious and the faithful. Bullinger goes on to say, Hendiades always raises the qualifying word to a superlative degree. But we are not to suppose that whenever we find two words joined together by the word end, that we have the figure Hendiades. It may be epitheton, which is renaming. It does not follow that in every case where two nouns are thus joined, we only have one idea. So you got to think. In the first place, there must be something to attract our attention. Something out of the ordinary. Something not strictly according to the letter. In this case, in Genesis, the doubling is unusual. See, and I add this is also very important. We want to know why the figure is there as much as what the figure is. You know, sometimes people are always teaching about, well, this is a figure and that is a figure, and this is a figure and that is a figure. And I'm out there in a crowd saying, tell me why, tell me why. Don't just impress me by ident identifying the figure. Give me the meat, baby, tell me why. Occasionally, even an undoubted Hendiades the two words may be equally true when taken separately and severally, Bullinger says, as when joined together in one. These cases, both the letter and the figure are correct, and the passage gains considerable light and force. Well, it does so because of the method of Hebrew analysis. They're taught to meditate and weigh A and B and weigh B and A, like in Hebrew poetry. That's, they're supposed to munch on it like that. See? So when both of them can carry their own weight, that's even more heavy. All right? Another point to be remembered is that the two words must have a certain relationship to each other. One must indicate a property of the other or be associated in some way with it. There cannot be a handiades where the two words are opposed in any way in their signification, nor even when there is no real connection between them. All right? Like the tree of good and evil. Those are opposites. That's not a handiades. That's a different thing. All right? So let's put this together. In Genesis 126, likeness is the second term. That's the one that's emphasized. But in Genesis 5.3, the second term is image. Therefore, what is being emphasized with Genesis 5.3? I think it is that Seth was a mirror image of Adam. The word image was amplified by placing it in the figure Hendiades, placing it in second position in Genesis 5.3. So, Seth looked just like his dad and may have had even some of the main, same mannerisms. Now, we've seen that, haven't we? Occasionally, sons look exactly like their father or grandfather, right? Well, that was a physical resemblance. Then the mannerisms can be both from nurture and nature. But in the case of the first time in Genesis 1.26, could Adam look exactly like God? No. Why? Because God is spiritual and Adam is physical. But they still matched in some way. How? In manners, in temperament, in demeanor, in traits. So do you get what it was saying by putting likeness in that position that's amplified in Genesis 126? God didn't give man his looks. He gave him his traits. Well, that's exactly what we covered 
into one God, one Lord, and one faith classes, following Rene Fretz's lead in his introductory paper, showing God's traits passed down God in Christ and Christ in us, likewise to the extent possible then, God was in Adam. Next is the heterosis, let us. Now, it's definitely in the let us category. Uh, that's the dressing in the word salad. <laughs> Hebrew often puts things in the plural to express magnitude. In the next verse, it gives the same, literally, in singular. Therefore, it's a gross violation of context to separate the two and only take the first part. It's obvious that one's figurative and the other is literal, so they must stay together. An example of heterosis, this kind, is in Genesis 29. This is when Jacob marries the daughters of Laban. Genesis 29, verse 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah is made for a handmaid. And it came to pass in the morning, comes out of the tent and sees who it was. Behold, it was Leah. Oh! And he said to Laban, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Didn't I serve you for Rachel? Why have you beguiled me? And... <laughs> Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Here comes the heterosis. Verse 29. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. Laban calls himself a we because he's in control. See, this is the royal we. Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter and wife also. So there's an example of the same thing, let us. Verse 27 is spoken with authority, hence we will give. It's the heterosis of magnitude that conveys the authority, and then the literal he gave is in the next verse. Now, the two decrees which repeat the dominion is a figure of speech called prosapidosis. That's not a grammatical figure, but it is a rhetorical one. It's not affecting merely the meaning of the words, but how they are applied. And Bullinger details this on page 394 of his Figures of Speech book. He says there are figures of repetition and addition of sense rather than of words and are used in reasoning. Sometimes the same sense is repeated in other words. Sometimes the words themselves are repeated, but always by way of amplifying the sense for purposes of definition, emphasis, or explanation. Then he divides this up into six categories where you have a repetition in this way, which is the prosapidosis, two phrases repeated, but the second one is expanded. And he gives repetition for definition, repetitio, repetition for amplification, amplificatio, for description, descriptio, for conclusion, conclusio, for parenthesis, interpositio, and for reasoning, rationositio. So, then he goes and talks about prosapidosis, or detailing. He says it's a returning for repetition and explanation. The figure is so called because after the mention of two or three words or subjects, there is a return to them again and they're repeated separately for purposes of definition or explanation. Hence, the decree to have dominion is further explained in the second pronouncement 
as to have dominion by being fruitful and multiplying and replenishing the earth and subduing it. The repeating also is the doubling, which is establishes the decree. It's not something of trivial nature, a wish, a whim, a possibility. No, it's a decree with certainty, support, and inevitability. Now, we know that Adam's dominion was transient. Yes, but did it have a future? Hmm. The next figure is anaphora. The repeating of the word over and over and over at the beginning of each phrase that adds weight. Bullinger says scripture abounds with this figure, which adds great importance to many of its solemn statements. So this figure occurs thrice, three times. Twice with repetitions of the word over and once with the word create. And of course, on top of that, we have the numerics, five for grace and three for completeness. Wow. See, you see how ornate this, this verse 26 through 28 is? Finally, we have the subtle switch in words with the image and likeness and image and image between verse 26 and 28 in the repetition between the two decrees. As I said earlier, the doubling gives a sense of certainty, even inevitability. But did Adam's dominion last very long? No. But will man get another opportunity? Yes. In the new heaven and earth, when we reign with his son, and hence, in the second repetition, likeness is subtly upgraded to image. <laughs> wow. Yea, verily, in our new bodies, after the resurrections, we shall bear an even closer likeness to our creator. Yea, not a mere likeness anymore, but an image. We will be spiritual beings. How beautiful. How deep. Can't you see this stuff is meant to be meditated upon? Well, hallelujah, sock it to you. It's perfections upon perfections. But God was not finished with the sixth day. Verse 29. And he said, Behold, I've given you every green herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed and to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creeps upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat and it was so and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Look at all those repetitions in there. Now, here we see the chapter break huh, is in the wrong place. It should continue on three more verses, then be a break. So, should be verse 32. Huh? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God entered his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all of his work which he created and made. We too are going to rest <laughs> after this and come back next week for more. God's the greatest and the wisest and the best and all the superlatives rolled into one. And I've done my best to bring that realization to you through this exposition of biblical beauty. What kind of impression has this left with all the royal repetitions that have brought out the sublime beauty and greatness of our God that is a message we'll never forget. See you next week. Bless you.